Hey folks, Jeff Salzman here and welcome to The Daily Evolver and to another episode of The Shrink and the Pundit, an ongoing series of discussions that I've been having over the last, I don't know how many years, with my dear friend and integral psychotherapist extraordinaire, Dr. Keith Witt. Hey, Dr. Keith. Hey, Jeff. Great to see you as always. How you doing? Doing great. And you? And yeah, I'm doing great too. I'm, I'm happy and involved in being an alive person. Well, there you go. There you go. <laughs> Ask for more than that. <laughs> and, and, and you're freshly back from a weekend uh, in Ken Wilber's loft where there was an event, a uh, private event uh, for uh, some people that uh, revolved around the, the subject of power. And that's what we want to talk about today and to have a little bit of a download as to what you folks did. And the title of the weekend was Tap Your Power in a Post-Truth World. So um, I guess let's just start there. Um, so you were Ken's Loft and, um, and you were talking about power. And I think that's a, it's a really interesting topic uh, because it's just so central to everything and it changes as we evolve, you know, the nature of power changes. So uh, why don't you just start there? Give us a little bit of a download of, about how the weekend went. Sure. Uh, there is, so there was Ken, we spent Saturday with Ken. Um, uh, f- uh, and Friday, Saturday morning and Sunday, uh, Rob Smith, Ginny Whitelaw, uh, me, and Bina Sharma at, uh, on Sunday gave presentations about different aspects of power. Uh, and so everybody had their own take on it. Uh, um, Ken uh, started, as always, with um, the larger context that power has been pathologized by green to a certain extent, which is not a good thing. <laughs> and that. Uh, and the green's ambivalent about exercising power, and orange and, and, and amber are absolutely not ambivalent about exercising power, which gives them quite an edge. And just for the beginners, here we're talking about these stages of development. So amber being traditionalists, these are kind of the conservatives, just broadly speaking. Uh, orange, the modernists, secularists. And then green are the liberals, again, broadly speaking. And you're right. But by the time you get to green liberalism, it's like power is uh, uh, sort of a bad word. It is. And that's a problem because yeah. it's everywhere. And that was part of my presentation on Sunday about we're all, everything's relationships and all relationships have power dynamics. Ken said that power is the effective display of confidence, which is very interesting and it got, right, raised some interesting questions. From the group and, and you know and the group was just your typical group of integral geniuses and artists and seekers just magnificent impressive people that you know every single one of them had great stories to tell one guy brought a movie he made that was just lovely about garden in morocco i mean it's just one thing after another of great yeah, stuff no, so you know it was a great group and so ken talked about power normalizing power and he played it off of uh, the chakras, meaning the first three chakras are monological in that, it, that you can't take the role of other. And so power, when you can't take the role of other, is dangerous. And that's where you get, see a lot of excesses. You got people who can't take the role of other, but they have power to affect other people who are objects. And as we've observed throughout our lives, into the present moment, the people that have power and see other people as objects can do pretty awful things. That's monological power, the first three chakras, you know, like the basic root chakra of, you know, food survival, the second one, life, sex, and the third one, power. Now, with these, these would be uh, relatable to the first three stages of development that we exactly. talk about in the aqua model, which is the archaic, the tribal, and the warrior stage. That's yeah, exactly or, right. or, or, or infrared, magenta, and red. Or the color. In, right. Infrared, yeah. magenta, and red. And then on green, the heart chakra and blue, the throat chakra, which um, uh, are uh, uh, analogous to... Um, uh, traditionalism and modernism. Traditionalism and modernism. You have dialogical. 
uh, processes where you can take the role of other. Um, you do you begin in limited fashion with just the, my own kin or my own family or my own people who share the missing me membership, but then it progresses, you know, progresses into other people. And then in the sixth and seventh chakra, um, you know, presence, thought, and then big mind um, in, in nadualism, you have translogical, which includes and transcends uh, monological and, and dialogical. And, you know, and tends... Uh, and how would, how would you define that? You define it as you... you and, and actually, let me stop you. So, to talk mon monological, can't take the perspective of others. Mm -hmm. Dialogical, you can take the perspective of others. And then what's the next one? Translogical. Okay. And translogical is that you expand in, into not just being able to take the perspective of other people, but being able to have a shared sense of identity with everything. Um, and then what, what Ken did later on when he was, uh, and he was making the point that on every single level, you could use power in a healthy or unhealthy way for good or for evil. You reference it off of your moral systems. And later on the next day, I talked about progressive moral systems being what guide us. And we want to stay with our leading edge moral system. And with most of us in integral, those leading edge moral systems are teal, turquoise, and even violet. Um, and, and so he led that into ex expanding until you go into Turiya, which is be emptiness as a witness, pure witness. You know, get that place where you're observing the world uh, as objects, but that who's observing is not an object. And then when the witness um, folds into what is observed into one taste, that's Turiya Tita. That's the non-dual realization. And that's how Ken ended his uh, presentation and answered questions and so on. So that was, that was our afternoon with Ken. Um, Ginny Whitelaw uh, did her Zen leadership stuff. And her Zen leadership, which is really familiar for me because you know, my lineage is Shotokan Karate, very Japanese. So she talked about the Hara and anchoring yourself and, trend and, 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 and power being basically um, uh, having an effect directing uh, energy to have an effect on the material world. And she talked about power to direct, um, power to organize, power to connect, um, power to expand into consciousness and creativity. Um, and you know, we, we all worked with those energies. Um, uh, when Rob talked, Rob talked about um, the flow of capital and the influence in the larger structure. Very interesting thing he said at Orange, which is rationalism, business, that kind of stuff, you have the power to contract. But then with green came, and now particularly with social media, came the power to convene. Um, and now at Teal, we have the power to um, integrate. Um, and of course, with tur turquoise, we have the power to integrate integration. We have the power to have different integrating forces integrating with each other meta integration, if you will. And then at Violet, you have the power to surrender to pure consciousness. Um, and Ken did some of that teaching himself saying, you know, you have motivation since so you get to the sixth and seventh chakra. And then, you know, when you're up there and you're just one with spirit, there really isn't any motivation. You're with the flow of consciousness. Um, now that has a, that has a moral direction in my opinion. And I'll talk about that in just a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but, it, but it's interesting, and, and it also explains why I had this conversation with Ken a year ago. I said, you know, Ken, I've been doing a lot of stuff and so on, but I, I've kind of been losing my ambition. Not, don't have a lot of ambition for anything. I just want to do the next piece of work. And he said, yeah, that's, that's very common. In, as you have more and more time in the second tier, you have less and less attachment, and so you have less motivation. And more, and if you're going to do stuff, you're doing stuff because spirit wants to do stuff through you. Mm -hmm. And if you, you and I were talking about that before the call. Yeah. And so in a way, if you've been a doer all your life, as most of us have, you kind of have to trust that spirit's going to want to do something. Well, that's, <laughs> and, and that really is an issue as we grow, because, uh, you know, we talk about the, the difference between first tier and second tier as being first tier, and, th and this is basically every stage of development up to postmodernism, up to green, you know. Yeah. So, uh, 
uh, is uh, in one way or the other fear-based. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, 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 something went terribly wrong. We have to fix it. Uh, we've been bad. We, you know, if we're, you know, we, we need to redeem ourselves and, you know, and that's the motivation. Uh, when we get to second tier, the, uh, the motivation is seen as creativity or love or uh, expression. And so we're not so motivated by fear. And uh, I think one of the things that happens is that that's how we lose our motivation. It's like, when I'm not like, you know, desperate for something, or if I don't have to make money, or if I don't have to, you know, fix something, you know, wh where does my motivation come from? And, th yeah. and this is also very, of course, tied into power. Because, yeah. you know, at some point, power just becomes distasteful. You know, yeah, unless, unless it's, it's, so now it's, you know, as usual, whenever you and I talk, like I have a billion associations, I go, Keith, stay focused. But I want to say that that's true for psychotherapy. First tier psychotherapy is there's something wrong, we have to fix it. Integral psychotherapy, second tier psychotherapy isn't that at all. Integral psychotherapy is you're an instrument of God growing and you have certain kinds of, you have things that are easy for you and blocks. And we want to help you with those blocks so that you can continue to blossom as consciousness and contribute to the evolution of consciousness everywhere, including a joyful life. It's a different orientation. Um, now, this the whole thing about power. Um, my part, my, my gig was um, growth higher hierarchies and dominator hierarchies in intimate relationships. Um, which she, for me, it was like a fastball right over the plate. <laughs> I went, oh yeah. David said, do you want to teach that? I said, are you kidding? <laughs> well, well, again, just to put it in the context of what we've been talking about, first tier structures are dominator hierarchies in one way or the other. By the a time lot of them, we, yeah. yeah. By the time we get to green, we're so over dominator hierarchies. That's actually, when we talk about green being ambivalent about power, there's a certain something that's good about that. I agree. Green looks back on history and says, enough of this. You know, enough of this one tribe or one religion or one group dominating another. And we're just over the whole power dynamics period. And that is a certain progress. I mean, there's a certain emptiness of, you, you want to empty yourself of power. Uh, and then there's a stage after that, which is when we get into the second tier integral, where we realize that these dominator hierarchies um, aren't necessary, but there still is a natural hierarchy. And that's what you're talking about. The difference between uh, a, a dominator hierarchy or, and a growth hierarchy, which is basically a developmental hierarchy. I mean, a child grows into an adult. They gain power as they do that. A, an acorn grows into an oak. You know, it gains power as it does that. These are natural hierarchies. So now we're trying to tune into that and it's just a little bit new and tricky. Yes. <laughs> now, my part of this was kind of taking a little different slant on growth hierarchies and dominator hier hierarchies. And that slant is everything is relationships. Relationships with all the inner aspects of ourselves and relationships with each other. All relationships have power hierarchies. And, and our brains have evolved to find position in those, uh, in those hierarchies and to maintain them. And there's two ways of doing that. We can maintain them through collaboration, growth hierarchies. And the growth hierarchies interactionally are we both have rights, we have respect for each other, and we're open to uh, giving and receiving caring influence. That's a growth hierarchy moment when we're doing it. You and I are doing it right now. But it's still a power hierarchy. You know, like right now, I'm talking. I have a little bit more power. Just that before, you were describing amber and orange and green. Uh, in, now, in the, in the second tier, this is what flex flow power is. It goes back and forth. In a growth hierarchy, it goes back and forth. In a dominator hierarchy, someone, is, we're not having mutual respect. We're not having individual rights. One person is trying to coerce another and, and force them essentially to submit and is resisting. 
influence from the other person. These happen all the time. Human beings are programmed to do both of these. And you know, that's why most of our brain is organized around relationships, because this is very complicated. And in all primate groups, you see exactly this happening. When they're all happy and relaxed, they share bananas with each other. When somebody gets threatened, again, or a defensive state, and they start doing fight or flight, dominator hierarchies with each other. And since they're, at least mammals, and primates especially, are so emotionally tuned in, they start doing epididactic display. They'll have um, displays of energy before they have physical violence. And those displays of energy create dominators and submitters that reestablish the social hierarchy before anybody gets hurt. Um, and there's about 10% of rhesus monkeys, for instance, that don't let that happen. They keep pushing beyond the, the, the pushback that they get from someone that they're challenging. And those rhesus monkeys have much higher death rate in those, in those troops than the ones that get into the rhythm, the social rhythm. Uh, so these are the monkeys who are resisting the dominator hierarchy. Yeah, they resist so they it. Get, they, they get killed. Well, what they do is they push back. When ever, since, since communication is always complementary, you bring a dominator hierarchy at me, I bring a dominator hierarchy back at you. And that's basic human attribution theory. Um, as Sharon said when, when he invaded Lebanon, you step on my foot, I cut off your leg. That's a dominator hierarchy. So either I, do, I try to out-dominate you or I allow myself to submit. I have reestablished a social framework you're on top, I'm on the bottom, and so on. I've allowed myself to be pushed around, but I've taken some damage from that because I haven't been treated respectfully. And this happens all the time. And so we might be having a growth hierarchy moment, and a lot of se almost all second tier communication is like that. And this is particularly important in the container of a second tier marriage or an intimate relationship. Um, and it's very, very tricky and fragile. And then one person's nervous system will read threat. When that person's nervous system reads threat, they go to the defensive state, that primitive response, amplified or numbed emotion, distorted perspectives that support fight or flight, destructive impulses to attack or submit or flee or freeze, and diminished capacities for empathy and self-reflection. And this is why people can't remember how to be good when they're having a fight because they've lost their capacities for empathy and self-reflection until they've developed a robust enough witness that they can observe that happening. Now this is, so when you and I are in a growth hierarchy, we're, we're relating, we're receiving influence, respecting, we have individual rights. I get threatened or you get threatened, say, you go into a defensive state, you start pushing or you start arguing or something. Now I can relate us out of that by saying, hey Jeff, you're a little upset. You go, God, I am. And all of a sudden we're back in the growth hierarchy. No, sir, you are. Yeah, well, maybe I am. <laughs> maybe let's examine maybe how I'm doing. You see what I'm doing? Yeah. Now, now, what I just did, so relating is just asking, but what I just did was handling. Okay. Handling is somebody's in a dominator hierarchy, and then what you're doing is you're trying to adjust them indirectly back into a growth hierarchy. And that's most of human connection, most of human inner discourse is relating personal, is relating and handling. And we do an awful lot of that in intimate relationships. And these defensive states show up an awful lot in intimate relationships because we feel as close as our family of origin and our primitive defenses and our primitive moral systems show up, the egocentric mm -hmm. moral systems, the, the magical and, and, and uh, mythical moral systems. And yes. I, you know, go on. I was just gonna say, I. I What's interesting to me as I think about it, even as you're talking here, is the difference in, um, you know, sort of a subjective state of having a, uh, a relationship that is in the growth hierarchy arena versus a dominator hierarchy, where the minute I feel dominated, I feel a contraction. Yes. I feel more solid, I feel more hardened. And you know, defensive, all of that stuff. When I'm in a relationship where I'm being, when when I'm when the other person is is willing to be influenced, when I'm willing to be influenced by them, when there's a real back and forth, there's a, it's almost like an outbreath, you know. There's a relaxation. 
that is, um, you know, palpable. Yeah. Now, now there's another, vari another variation here that makes it even more complicated. We have drives to compete against each other. Humans like that. You, particularly testosterone likes that. Little boy games involves competing against each other, wrestling against each other, pushing each other around, um, martial arts. And this is why when you look at a lot of games, what are those games? They're games that provide a container within which we can be respectful, we can be influenced by each other, but we get to go after each other and try to dominate each other. And we're doing it to make each other stronger. That's a football game. That's a karate sparring match. Um, that's that kind of stuff. Because we have a drive to do that. And it feels good. It feels good to dominate another person. All right? It feels good to put your strength up against another strength or to win an argument or to go back at somebody that's coming at you. You know, I mean, when you hear these stories, you can feel the satisfaction. Yeah, my boss told me that, that you know, I was a loser. And I told him to go fuck himself. Okay, and we all go, yeah, you told him to go fuck himself. You know, you out dominated him. Okay. We have a satisfaction. Now, you got to be aware of the pleasure of that because when you get upset, people that have been successful dominating other people will want to go there. Okay. Now, unfortunately, in intimate relationships, that way lies madness and destruction. And so you need to feel that urge to push back. Or if you've been codependent all your life, that urge to say, sure, anything you say, whatever you say, I'll do it, fine. My default mode is I surrender, okay? Even if I feel bad about me and about you, okay? Now, these are all first tier defenses and they do not support second tier intimacy. They do not support the kind of inner subjectivity that helps humans grow the most. And, and they are power dynamics and they are dominator hierarchies that naturally arise. If we can observe the growth hierarchy and the dominator hierarchy, one, we reach for growth hierarchies like you and I are now. Two, if one of us enters a dominator hierarchy, the other one can resist the impulse to go into it and start either relating or handling the other person towards a growth hierarchy again, and now we're back. Now, in a second-tier marriage, this happens all the time. Give, me a, give, give us an example of that, Keith. So we're getting into a, a struggle with our significant other. Yeah. And uh, we're feeling ourselves get hardened and contracted. And then what? I'll give you a good example. Okay, so we're a couple. And we've got an 11-year-old son. Okay? This 11-year-old son won't clean up his room all right and so i say well it's his room let him do whatever he wants and you say i don't want him to teach him how to live in filth and clutter and all that kind of stuff and i go what do you think you are you know you're, you're gonna screw up our son teach him how to do this you go no don't tell me we're gonna screw up my son you see her now we're going back and forth i'm trying to dominate you into my position you're trying to dominate me into yours you know, Bina Sharma did polarities on the second day. Polarity is you find opposing forces that are neutral or positive, and you go to the polarity, what's good and bad on the inside. We're not doing that. No, no. You know, we need to let him do what he wants in this room. No, no. We need to force him to clean it up. You, now, I'm accelerating now. You're being a bad parent. Well, you're not going to take that. You're accelerating. You're being a bad parent. Okay, and now all of a sudden we're fighting about how we parent our son. And we're having a bad time and I'm getting scared of you and you're getting scared of me. And that's horrible for a relationship. You know, you know, like there's some exceptions to this, but you can't scare and intimidate and give each other shit for like five or six hours and then go to bed and have good sex. Can't really do it. Okay, and so what happens? Your, your marital friendship gets thrown to hell, your marital love affair is compromised, and you feel a, a sense of despair about resolving ruptures. And you know, what is that container? You know, that, that, that container is a love affair, a friendship, our capacity to um, uh, heal ruptures and problems, and our commitment to each other's mutual evolution. Okay, that's that sacred container. That's that second tier marriage that we all want. We're, at this point, we're damaging it. And, and time is not a neutral of this. The longer we do it, the more damaged and scared we get. Okay, so that's bam. So say I decide 
you know, the, I want to handle you because I can't relate to, with you around this. So I, I back off. I go, okay, I really get that we don't want him to be chaotic and normalize being chaotic. Okay, I get that. And I, and, and I want to help with that. And I, I support that as a principle and, and helping our son. I also want him to have some sense of agency in his own space. Um, so how are we going to deal with that? Now, you notice how you feel as my partner as I say that? You're being kind of getting sucked into a growth hierarchy with me. No, I can feel the relaxation in real time as you even say that. Yeah. And now you go, well, yeah, you're right. Um, we do want him to have agency. And now we're working the polarities. You know, now we've got a second tier container. Now we're looking, we're open to influence. We have individual rights to our opinion and we have respect for each other. And we're trying to support the evolution of each other and our, and our son. Okay, we've maintained that container. Not only that, if we did it efficiently, we become a little bit more secure with each other. Because I know when you get pissed at me, you're willing to go into this container if I'm willing to go into this container and co-create it and maintain it with me. So we're actually, uh, and again, using polarity theory here, we're including, we're basically expanding the space to include both of those points of view. And going to the tension in between, looking for what we like and don't like, looking for what works and doesn't work, and looking for what emerges out of the dialectic. And the dialectic is characteristic of growth hierarchies. The dialectic is basically doing polarities. Socrates you know, used it to create the, the perennial philosophy. Okay. Now, here's, an, here's another thing about this. We have progressive moral systems. You know, we've talked about this before that we develop from conception onward. We have a visceral moral system where we're genetically programmed to see some things as good and bad. For instance, we're genetically programmed to see snakes and spiders as bad. Human beings see that as good. Then we have a magical moral system that what our parents tell us is good or bad is good or bad, okay? Then we have a mythic moral system that's based on some framework. And you can see how we're going up from red, you know, egocentric to conformist. Then we have a rational moral system that's based on it needs to fit together. And then we have a post-rational system where it really needs to involve caring for other people. And then we have a post-post-rational integral moral system where what serves the highest good, and there's a lot of shades of gray, there's a lot of relativistic things happening. And we do, so some people just get arrested at one level and all they have is an egocentric moral system. And then it's just all about them and other people are objects. And that's just third chakra without any fourth chakra. But those of us that grow, then most of the people listening, hi everybody, you know, all the seekers, all you guys, you have an advancing edge moral system that's post-rational and post-post-rational. Now, all the moral systems that's included in Transcend are always, are always acting all the time, okay? which I find quite interesting. You mean, you, you mean the whole stack of moral systems are online? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I used to think when I was in my 20s, thank God for integral, I used to think because I always referenced, how is it going to affect Keith? I thought, you know, Keith, you're just basically a selfish guy. You know, you must be a narcissist because you always check out how is it going to affect Keith. Now, I was doing a lot of service. I was really caring for a lot of people. I was volunteering and stuff. But I thought that when I matured, that a mature, unselfish person is somebody who never felt selfish, who never referenced their, those original Moses. Not so. What happens as we mature is we put the advancing edge moral system increasingly in charge. And as those moral systems grow, after a while, it's not a system at all. It's just our connection with the infinite. And then infinite is using us. And that's a moral system, okay, that has included all the other ones. That's included care and rights for all. That's included flex flow. And under those circumstances, sometimes you need a dominator hierarchy. If you're dealing with an egocentric person who objectifies other people, if you want to bring them to the table, you have to kick their ass first. And that's also true often for conformist people who say, I'm going to stick with my ideology. Well, you got to kick their ass and then they'll compromise. And with a rational person, you know, I'm just going to get away with ripping off the environment because it gives me more shares for my stock or so you don't know you can't, you can't rip off the environment. You're going to have to change. Okay. I'll change. 
I won't rip off the environment because you gave me a rule. That's essentially giving a rule is kick, you know, and so you can see how the, the quadrants all work with this. And, and an interesting thing I observed in myself around this relating and handling thing. Every time I teach this, there's a little part of me that thinks handling somebody is less moral than relating. Isn't that interesting? Because it's well, not. It's, it, well, it's, it's less developed, uh, but well, necessary. Yeah, see, that, I mean, what it is, is it's less attractive. Okay, it's an upper left, not a lower left. Because if somebody is caught up in a dominator hierarchy and I'm handling them, okay, then actually that's a beautiful response. Yeah. Because, like, because I'm handling what's necessary. them. It's necessary. It's necessary. And so, and not only is it a beautiful response, it's a moral response. Yeah. Because instead of deserting this person who's trying to dominate me, which is a flight reaction, I'm staying engaged and doing my best to handle this into a growth mindset. And this, you can see how people in the world get the quadrants mixed up because something doesn't meet their beautiful standard. They say, well, then it's not true or it's not good. Or if it doesn't feel good, they go, well, then it must not be. True. For instance, according to science, if we want to get rid of Huntington's Korea, everybody who has that gene doesn't breed and doesn't have children. Okay. From a scientific standpoint, that makes perfect sense. But from a lower left standpoint of individual dignity, that makes no sense whatsoever, okay? And along those lines, because the lower right, the, the laws are based in our America on the upper left dignity of the individual, you know, rights, individual rights, and the lower left, the dignity of the relationship, whatever you do in your relationship is, is, is up to you. An upper right person can't come in like the Nazis did and say, if you have Huntington's Korea, you can't have children, okay? You know why? Because we have a system that was put in place where the quadrants are gonna be honored and it's privileged towards the dignity of the individual in the United States, which is the great strength of the United States. And we're seeing that great strength dealing with, you know, the basically the fascistic energies coming from the top and the pushback from everybody. Okay? Um, and so along those lines, handling is beautiful, when that's what you're supposed to do. And you, of course, we always want to be adjusting towards relating and towards creating those intersubjective containers. Sometimes you can't. And if you can't, then there, your advancing edge moral system, what serves the highest good says, well, I'll tell you what to do. You know, try to recruit somebody into a growth hierarchy. I'll tell you what to do. If you have to set boundaries for somebody, you have to kick their ass before they can move, kick their ass if, if that's moral according to the contract, the system that you have. Um, yeah. It's just, it's just, it was just interesting to me to find that bias in me. And I know all this stuff. And yet there I am when I teach it, I feel a little bit yeah. handling it isn't as moral, you know, it doesn't even yeah. as good. Yeah. Well, and we can also, it, it seems to me, be kind of conscious and playful with it in a way. And I think of sexuality uh, where, um, you know, domination and submission is part of the juice oh. of it and can be. You know, as long as we're not really dominating and submitting, like you do in the earlier stages of development, but we're all, we're, we're playing with that. And, and we realize that that's actually a stage beyond the idea that uh, men and women are completely equal and you, you know, we want to get rid of all of those kinds of power dynamics and then all of a sudden we can't get it up. Yeah, which sucks. <laughs> Speaking from occasional personal experience, <laughs> it sucked. Also, Ken made this point. You know, if you're monological and you can't take the role of other, domination submission is rape. If you're dialogical, you're taking the role of other, it's ravishment. And the one thing that uh, is true for absolutely every sexual choice, okay, every sexual choice of two people together having sex, the one thing that they all have in common is that there's a top and a bottom during the sex. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a leader and a follower. There's a dominator and a submit, submitter. Now, if that involves mutual respect, individual rights, and the sense of wanting to grow and create more joy, that's a growth hierarchy. Even if I'm tied up to the bed and you're torturing me, you know, with, you know, with, you know, thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I'll have another. I mean, 
if we're having a good time, that's a growth hierarchy. Because, yeah. <laughs> well, we're all in the game together. We're both in the game together. It's, you know, it's fun. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so. And, and you're right. Green loses that. Yeah. Green says we have to have equal power, so we have to pretend that there's not a top and a bottom in sex. Yeah. You know, data goes crazy over this. You know? you're, you're yeah, talking, yeah. D David Data. David Data, you know, talks, he was a spiritual teacher that focuses on masculine, feminine, and sex. Talking about how egalitarian green women have to go to biker bars to get a guy who'll ravish them. Right. <laughs> so guys can't do it. Right. Yeah. So there you go. So you, it's the, now, you notice how you talk about play. Well, this is we go back to everything is relationships. Because when we're in growth hierarchies with each other, we're playing. It's fun. You know, I have a lot of fun these days, and I can't do the things that I used to do to play very much because, uh, you know, I got a 68 year old body that can't fight on the karate floor, play tennis, or, you know, surf, big surf. But I'm playing with you now, okay? Yeah. And I'm having just as much fun as when I used to go, you know, surf, okay? We love to play, we need it. And, and play doesn't happen in dominator hierarchies. You know, people in the football field are kicking the shit out of each other. It looks like they're dominating each other. That's a form of play because within that container, everybody's treated with respect. Everybody has rights. And the goal is to follow the rules and have whatever comes, comes. And the price that I pay stepping into the octagon is I have a chance to dominate a worthy opponent. And the price that I pay is they might dominate me. Okay. And that feels fine. I'm on board with that. You know, I've, ac I've accepted that and I feel like a stronger, more complete human being as I engage in that play. Yeah. And so, yeah. So did you guys get into um, politics? I mean, I think <laughs> one of the things we're seeing is that, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the things that's so attractive about Trump to people for whom he's attractive is his power. Yep. You know, his, uh, you know, w willingness to use it in a way that, say, an Obama wouldn't. Yep. And, you know, that's repulsive to a lot of us. And that's very, very attractive to a lot of us. And, you know, boy, are we tr sorting that one out. Ooh. Yeah. Yes, we've got into it. Now, he doesn't just use it. He enjoys bullying people. Okay. Remember, we have an instinct to bully. We have an instinct to bully those that threaten us. Okay, so let's look at the far right ideologues that he attracts and, you know, uneducated white guys who feel disenfranchised and pushed around by, uh, you know, liberal elites and minorities and everybody else they, they're scared of. Trump bullies those other people. He doesn't just, you know, set boundaries. He, he is disrespectful. He is contemptuous of them. Obama, Obama refused to bully anybody. Okay, he just wouldn't do it. He'd set boundaries, but he'd always do it really respectfully. Okay, okay well, Trump is the, this is the red meat for red and amber and for orange, for pathological, egocentric, pathological conformist, pathological, rational. We get to climb aboard and we get to bully the people we're pissed at. You know, it's just, you know, all those guys, you know, all the, all the super conservative people I've ever, I've ever worked with, they really love those novels where, you know, the American assassin breaks all rules. Yeah, I can't follow the rules because I have to do right. I, I don't have to follow the rules so that I get to go kick the shit out of this other person and have no consequences. I don't have to follow the rules. I'm serving a higher cause. That's why I'm going to go kill this person, even though you're not supposed to kill people. And so Trump, so what, what does he become? He becomes a, a, a cartoon figure. He becomes a comic book guy. He becomes, oh yeah, I get to vote for Batman, you know, because he doesn't just dominate him, he, do, he bullies them. And we like people who bully the people we want to bully. And if we're not aware of it, if we don't have that level of self-awareness, we're seduced by it. And we put up with him being a vile person because we get to do that. Because that well, feels it, it, satisfying. And I would argue also that people who are, you know, have a center of gravity at traditionalism or uh, even you know, people at Orange and uh, who have sort of the, a tradi traditionalist heart or a red heart, uh, they feel safer with him. Yeah. 
I, I, I remember talking to some of my uh, relatives back home who were big Trump supporters, and uh, they didn't feel safe with Obama. They didn't feel like he was fighting for them. They didn't feel like he, they, he made them nervous. Yeah. In a way that they can, they can relax with Trump. Yeah, because as, we, as long as we subjectively think we're part of his army or his tribe, then we feel safe. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. like, you know, in red, I mean, you're always, if we're talking about this red warrior stage of development, you're always looking for who do I align with who's going to protect me? And, know, who's who are we, and who are we protecting ourselves from? The other who pushes that. Like, as you said long ago, and it really resonated, Amber needs an enemy. And the enemy is not a person. The enemy is objectified. And so those children, okay, those children are being fucked up by being separated from their parents for the rest of their lives, a lot of them. But they're not really human beings. You know, they're objects. Um, and so he's doing that to keep this threat, this immigrant threat away from us. Even though if we had to rely on the American reproduction stuff for, for a workforce in 20 years, we'd be in really bad shape. We need immigrants, you know, to have our economy continue. But, you know, that's a rational argument and irrational doesn't work. And so, yeah, so we talked about that. And an interesting thing, David Reardon went to um, an evangelical conference and he was expecting people to talk about, you know, progressive evangelicalism, which is interesting because evangelicals are amber, okay? And they were completely political. And here's what they were outraged about. All the corrupt evangelicals, the ones that they think are just criminals, you know, just bullshit artists, they all aligned with Trump because, okay, he's going to do our agenda and we can make a lot of money and so on. And these guys said, that's going to be really bad for the country. And so... What, these pre progressive evangelicals said? Yeah, they were yeah. furious. And this is great because, you know, evangelicals really know how to get things done. So they organized and they're creating a bus tour that's going to go around the country. Um, I forget the name of it. It's just a very cool name. And they're going to preach to people about, about Christian values you know, about love thy neighbor. Um, it was fascinating that, that out of one thing that came out of Trump, a pushback, was there's a progressive group of evangelicals now that are apparently aligning themselves with um, progressives in the interest of a higher good. You know, th that, that basic Christian teaching of love thy neighbor. Yeah. And so it's Stuff like yeah. that is what is what came out when we were discussing, you know, politics. Right. Well, and Rob and Rob, of course, talked about it when he talked about capital and so on. Yeah. What's uh, um, sort of uh, got me concerned is that, you know, I, I think that the people who are not Trump supporters, uh, who are, you know, either repulsed or you know indifferent. Uh, you know, or when we talk about the, the progressive uh, backlash or resistance, uh, I'm not sure that's enough. Uh, and I'm not seeing uh, a positive direction coming from progressives in a way. And, I completely agree. And, and I think that comes from that ambivalence about power. Yes. Without a vision, the people will perish. Yeah. And okay, it's well, not just enough to be anti-Trump. Where do you want to take us? You know? see, see, I know where I want to go. And I've known it all along. Um, uh, you, you, you know, one of the questions that people had was, um, let me see, it was about suicide. It was about psychopathology. It was about education. And, I, and my point about this was, I, these conversations drive me crazy because basically these conversations are, since we can't really go for the real solution, what can we do to make it more comfortable for us with all these problems, since we're not going to actually deal with the real problem? The real problem is that when you have poverty, and, we, and when you have people that are having kids and you, and you have ignorance, we have people that are having kids when they're teenagers, because you're not giving them proper sex education and you're not giving them proper nourishment psychologically emotional or safety because 
um, uh, that costs too much or because we're being a nanny state, if we're not helping those people feel secure around money and, and, and education and healthcare and that kind of stuff, those kids are going to experience neglect and abuse. And that, that neglect and abuse will translate into psychopathology and suicide and crime. If, if we make them feel secure, like they do in Northern Europe, the rates of crime and psychopathology and suicide go down 50% in a generation, maybe more. And this isn't theory, this has been demonstrated. And it hasn't just been demonstrated in Europe. In several programs, you have somebody come to a teenage mother once a week who has a kid. 90% of these kids have behavioral problems by four years old, problems at school, hyperactivity, aggressiveness. They have somebody come one day a week, hang out with this mother, teach her how to cuddle her baby, teach her how to play with the kid, teach her about attachment. Four years later, those kids have half as many problems. And so every family in this country, every mother in this country should have access to that. And nobody should be worried about food, shelter, healthcare, or education. And if we do that, problems become solved. But we can't do that because um, we have a system that won't let us do that. So what, what kind of better therapy can we get for somebody, you know, a teenage, 16 year old teenager who just raped his girlfriend and is in jail for the next three years? Well, we can do therapy with that guy, but you know, he might be lost. We could have gotten to him when he was six months old or a year old or two years old. By getting to him, I mean get to his family because kids are symbiotic beings with their parents. And we could have put a little love into that system, a little education, a little security in that system, and he wouldn't have raped his girlfriend at 16. But are we doing that? No, we're not doing that. But now, my dominator hierarchy, my power god says, well, fucking Keith was in charge. I'd tell all the rich people to give me 10% of their money, and I'd take $2 trillion, and I would put it into our country, and I would build up the infrastructure and I would take care of all the kids and I would give a universal wage to everybody and I would give a lot of money into, to, to, to basic research and everything would get great. Kind of like what they do in Singapore. You know, they got to have a philosopher king. Yeah. You're the second person I've ever heard uh, argue for that 10% thing. Uh, <laughs> the other one, Donald Trump. And that was years ago, I remember, what a guy. <laughs> where he said, you know, simple solution for the deficit. He had said there's, there's two, actually, two, two simple solutions. One is don't pay. You know, don't pay the creditors. Fuck China. The other was, that, that's typical Trump. The other one was do a one-time surcharge of, of people with a wealth over a certain amount of money of 10%. Yeah, not even one time. Well. Yeah. Two, very interesting, two, two very different solutions, but I, you know, I'd never heard anybody say that. And, you know. Me and Trump. Well, I heard it from Michael, uh, um, Michael Moore. You know, somebody enough. said to Michael Moore, how are you going to pay for all this health care? He said, where's the money? He said, the money is all over the place. He said, you know, you take 10% off the top and then you raise everybody's uh, taxes 4%. Oh my God, you know, instead of having $9 billion, I have $8.5 billion. Instead of making like $5 million this year, I made $4.5 million this year. Sorry, yeah. I am not sympathetic to people being upset about that. Yeah. And take that money and take care of business. Yeah. Okay? Well, you could feel even in your uh, energy right now that there is a red energy to that. There's a fuck this. Oh, yeah. You know, the, 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 you know, this is outrageous. This has to change, you know. And so I think we're going to have to find this sort of weird unicorn liberal who can be both, you know, you know greed and integral and all of that, but still have a readily accessible red so that and we can get, you know, excited. His that's red, teal. Red is juicy. That's teal. Teal draws from all of them. Teal draw. You know, I'm a martial artist. So I teal is red. that first stage of integral, just for people who are trying. Yeah, to yeah. Okay, that's that first stage. Yeah, I love that stuff. And you know, when it's necessary, you know, I, you know, I, I was a little bit too over the top. I mean, I never ever hit anybody in violence in, in deliberately that I can think of, even though I had lots of you know fights in, in martial arts studios. But I, I remember when I split up with, uh, I, I had a partner that I couldn't stand. And I finally just kind of left. 
But before we left, we were in a car, and he said, well, I want you to promise me something, Keith. I said, what? Because I was just disgusted with this guy. He said, I want you to promise you'll never hit me. Hmm. And I thought to myself, okay, I, have, I haven't hit anybody in anger since I was 15 years old. This was like, I don't know, I was 28. And yet this guy sees enough red in me to be frightened. And also he's aware of how much I hate him at this moment. That he wanted, and he wanted to control me in some fashion. He wanted me to promise not to hit him. You know, and, you know, in retrospect, and I said, sure, I promise not to hit you because I don't yeah. hit people. Yeah, but you know, reasonable. Yeah, but you know, in retrospect, I'm sorry I did that. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry to say, look, I don't hit people. I'm not going to promise you anything. Fuck you. I was pretty pissed off at the time, I got to say. And yeah. that was red. But you know, it's include and transcend. That energy protects me in a street fight. That energy gives me righteous energy to go against people that come back and, you know, the, the next Democratic uh, 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 candidate, people are going to tell vile lies and wage war like Putin has against that person like they did about Hillary. And it'll be really nasty. And they're not going to tell it's, it's going to be really awful. And, we, and those vile lies need boundaries. Now, we don't want to come back and try to out Amber Amber because you can't do that. You never beat the people at their same name, at their same. But they need to have their ass kicked in a respectful fashion. Ass kicked. You can't tell vile lies without a consequence. Okay. And where do you get the energy for that? Red. Where do you get the moral? Where do you, you know, the, you, you have more power and more confidence you have. This was a, a, a question. How do you get confidence? And this is how you get confidence. You identify your advancing edge moral system and you let that make the call. And the advancing edge moral system in, in the second tier is we do what it takes to move forward the evolution of consciousness. And that means every solution once in a while is the right solution. And not only is it the right solution, you need to be able to embrace it enthusiastically. Mm -hmm. And that's not green. Green cannot enthusiastically embrace using power to set boundaries for another person because they're doing something unacceptable. Yeah, because greed is very nervous about the whole idea of setting boundaries and saying this is in and that's out and this is right and that's wrong. There's a, you know, that deep relativity, uh, you know, and th that, that sort of uh, uh, repulsion at all of human history, which was, you know, to go back to our dominator hierarchy. So yeah, so the solution is to move forward. Yes. So that we have these higher moral systems that include the lower moral systems. Include and transcend. Yeah. And you notice the power that a lot of the, this is, this is the genius of Obama. The Affordable Care Act gave people rights. And so now a lot of the power of progressives is saying, we take a stand that we are not going to let you lose the right to have health care with a pre-existing uh, condition. We take a stand that no child is going to lose the right to be with their parents. We take a stand that insurance companies can't drive you bankrupt because it costs too much to keep you alive or to heal your injury. We're taking a stand for you, and we're not going to back down from that stand. That's when they start having credibility. Okay, that's where they get to be, that, that's where they're shifting out of green into teal, in my opinion. Yeah. We're not going to let that happen. Okay, that doesn't that feel good? You know, yeah. to hear me say that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's healthy red right there. Yeah. Right on. That's power. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, so, so any other piece of the puzzle that you guys talked about that we should look at here? Or yes. We get it all set and we're complete and perfect here. Here's the last thing. Um, and like I said, for me, uh, dominator hierarchies, growth hierarchies, and intimate relationships was, was a fat, fastball over the plate. One thing that I noticed, and I always notice this in groups like this, that there was an intersubjectivity of love that got created that had an enormous amount of potency to it. Um, my kids, when they were kids, said, when I gave, told them stories, said, Daddy, is there magic in this world? And I said, absolutely, there's magic in this world. The magic of this world is we love each other. That, that in that intersubjective feeling, and I felt it in that group when I was um, leading the group and when I wasn't leading the group, there is inexhaustible power that comes through in us together 
wanting to serve God, wanting to serve the world. And if we're doing it from teal, we do what it takes. We're not being limited by first tier fears or inhibitions or allergies. And to me, that's the best power. That's the deepest power. That's the deep structural power that we only have in relationship with each other. You know, in that lower left, shared love and commitment to a higher level, our advancing ed moral systems. And those advancing edge moral systems naturally harmonize with each other into a shared purpose, which is what you're worried about because green doesn't have it, it's too chaotic. It has to grow to that next level where all of a sudden it clarifies. And here we are together, loving each other, loving the world with a clear mission and committed to that. Yeah. I felt that in that group. And I feel it right now with you. And that's the best power. That's the deepest power. That's the power that's going to usher us into the integral age. Yeah. No, that's very encouraging. And, and, and we can see even through history that every stage is more powerful than the, than the, than the previous one, even though it's, it's less chaotic and less violent in a certain way. Uh, but, and that continues. And so uh, to sort of mark and, and, and identify this power that comes from, you know, love instead of fear. Yeah. Uh, is, uh, is it's, it's really exciting. It is exciting. It is. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful and optimistic. And more so really than I've ever been before, which is bizarre in the current uh, political climate. But I'm, I'm yeah, me, more and more. Too, actually, me too. I mean, there's, there's a lot to say about that. And, 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 you know, thank goodness we'll just continue this conversation in, in di you know, different ways and different topics. But, uh, yeah, uh, you know, identifying the power that comes from these uh, the, the higher stages, the more, the more inclusive stages is really uh, key to the integral project. Well, and we're going to, our next talk is going to be about suicide. We already decided about that. And all the stuff that we talked about today is just central to that particular problem in the United States. And, you know, we'll get into that. Cool. But that'll be in our next episode, everybody. Yes. Make sure you tune in. Yeah. <laughs> well, cool. So in the meantime, talking about moving from fear into love, uh, let's uh, tell us a little bit about, you, you, you've got a, a, a what, you're doing something with your Loving Completely course? Yeah, Integral Life, I'm Loving Completely, I, I took that course and turned it into a book called Loving Completely. And it's being published, it's going to be the first imprint of Integral um, Life Publishing, which is totally, I'm totally stoked about that. It's coming out in a, a month or two. Um, and so that's lots of fun. Uh, I'm going to um, be teaching in Brazil in October. I'm going to teach a workshop in uh, integrally informed psychotherapy and uh, working with individuals, couples with trauma. And I'm gonna be doing a workshop on a five-star process on intimacy, on a five-star process for creating uh, uh, great relationships, loving completely material. I'm excited about that. And so those are, that's what I'm currently into. Um, I'm okay. still working on my trauma book, but I think uh, there's other stuff that probably won't be uh, uh, available for s six months to a year. Um, and wow. So that's, what, that's what's happening right now. And, and, you know, when my book comes out, go out and buy it. It's a great book, everybody. <laughs> You'll love it. <laughs> Loving completely. Loving completely. That's right. Yeah. Well, Keith, you know, thank you so much for, you know, what you're doing and oh. for moving the ball and for helping to chart this new territory. It's really, um, really, I'm really grateful. Well, I'm not doing it alone, Jeff. I'm doing it with you. I'm doing it with Ken. I'm doing it with the people at my, the workshop. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a lens. Stuff comes through me. But I'm a lens to, for a community of people that I'm connected to that, that feed me and that I feed. And I feed their projects. I feed your projects. Yeah. You know, we're all doing this, Jeff. Yeah. You're doing it. We're ushering in the next stage of human history. Yes, we are. And I'm glad to do it. Yeah, cool. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you again, Dr. Keith Witt. And, and of course, thank your you website did. is drkeithwitt.com. That's right. People want to check you out. And uh, so uh, we'll see you uh, next time. 